Okay, I'm unmuted now. So good morning, everyone, and welcome from Village Well Books and Coffee, a new bookstore cafe in downtown Culver City with a community focus and a mission to provide comfortable, welcoming third place for people to connect, learn, and find inspiration. We carry books in a wide variety of categories, and our cafe serves fresh, healthy food for breakfast, lunch, and as well as snacks. And we're looking forward to expanding our hours into the evening soon, and we'll be bringing you an aperitivo hour with beer, wine, and small plates. When you're in the area, I hope you'll come and check us out. Today, we are thrilled to host this conversation between Thomas O'Hara Small and George Packer. Thomas is one of the first best friends this business had. I believe he was serving as mayor when I first connected with him for support and wisdom about finding a place in Culver City to open the village well. And he and his wife, Joanna Brody, have been incomparable partners in connecting us with this wonderful community. When Thomas brought us the opportunity to have a conversation with George Packer, we couldn't believe our luck. The topics George discusses in his books about the decline of American democracy and civilization are exactly the kinds of topics I've hoped this space could be used to shine a light on and explore in depth and help us all understand better. I'm gonna hand it out over now to Nikolai Blaumer, the director, program director for the Thomas, Thomas Mann House, our co-host for, co for this event. Thank you all for joining us and thank you so much to our guests for letting us share your conversation with our community. Thanks a lot, Jennifer. As program director of the Thomas Mann House, I would also like to welcome you from Pacific Palisades for our program today, Last Best Book with George Pecker and Thomas Small. Several years ago, George Pecker wrote an article titled The Quiet German for the New Yorker. He described the contrast between the stability of Germany in 2014 and a world that is unhinged. Angry young protesters fill the public squares of countries around the world, he wrote in his piece, but German crowds gather for outdoor concerts and beery World Cup celebrations. Well, even though many people are once again gathering to watch soccer these days, the political world in the United States, as in Germany, has become far more confusing. With his book, Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal, published this week by Farah's Cross and Zerun, Hitler brings order to this confusing political situation. He examines causes for the shocks of recent years, and points to ways out of the political malaise. It's a great honor to welcome George Pecker and Thomas Ajero Small to our program today. And before I briefly introduce both of them, I would like to thank Village Well Books for their support and collaboration on this event. We are two wonderful guests. George Pecker is an award-winning author and staff writer at The Atlantic. His previous books include The Unwinding, An Inner History of New America, The Assassin's Gate, America and Iraq, and Our Man, Richard Holbrook and the End of the American Century. He's also the author of two novels and a play, and the editor of a two-volume edition of George Orwell's work. Thomas Ajero Small is founder and CEO of the nonprofit Culver City Forward. He's formerly served on the city council of Culver City and was elected unanimously as mayor by his colleagues on the city council in 2018. Prior to his election, he served as commissioner of cultural affairs. He's also a member of the advisory board of the Thomas Mann House. And a last remark, if you wanna ask a question, please feel free to post it into the YouTube chat um, next to our screen. Dear Thomas, dear George, thank you for being with us and the floor is yours. Good morning, George, it's great to see you. Um, you know, I'd like to start out by, by first recognizing uh, that today is Juneteenth. Um, and I, you know, I think this is the first time that this is, that Juneteenth has been recognized as a national holiday uh, by, by the United States. Um, and I'm, I think it's, it's you know, hugely appropriate that we're having this discussion today about the, about the future of, of democracy um, as, as I think 
you know, in the original Juneteenth was a moment at, at which America took a step forward in, in democracy. And, and hopefully we're, you know, we'll be able to do that as well in this time. But um, so I'd, I'd also like to start up. George, I'm sorry, I'm not hearing you. Should, should we explain to the German audience what Juneteenth is in case they don't know? Yes. Yes. Um, I was, please go ahead. Yeah. It's, it's the day that um, enslaved people, enslaved black people in Texas found out that they had been freed. It happened in, on June 19th, 1865. That is to say like two, ye- two months after the end of the Civil War and two years after the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln that set free the slaves. So it was a, a moment of celebration and in black American tradition. It's been celebrated ever since, but America itself only became aware of Juneteenth. I think most Americans only became aware of it recently, and um, it is a long time coming, and it's it's about time that it's now a national holiday. Congress actually voted for it just two days ago, which is a kind of a miracle in, in our day and age. But anyway, go ahead, Tom. Absolutely, and I hope a harbinger for our future. Um, but I'd also I'd also want to start out by by thanking the the Thomas Mann House for hosting us, uh, and particularly Nikolai Blaumer, uh, Stephen Levine, uh, who brought me to the Thomas Mann House as the, as the chair of the advisory committee, uh, and Ben O'Hertz, who's who's helping us uh, behind the scenes, and also uh, thanks to our spectacular new uh, Village Well bookstore here in Culver City. Um, you know, I, I, I think it's also, you know, very particularly interesting and special that we are holding this event with the Thomas Mann House, uh, you know, on, you know, given given that the Thomas Mann House has, you know, since its inception has been, you know, very focused on the future of democracy and the issues of democracy. So I think this discussion fits in perfectly with the with the programming that is done before uh, here at the Thomas Mann House, especially the the uh, 55 Voices for Democracy uh, series of podcasts that celebrate uh, Thomas Mann's, uh, you know, contributions on the radio during the war to to talking about democracy. The future and the fate of democracy are, are definitely key here. Um, the, uh, you know, it's also, it's also very interesting in that we have an audience in Germany and I know we have some participants from Switzerland, um, and across the country. Um, and then the, the other thing that's particular about this, this event, I mean, I, I think both, you know, George more than me, but probably, but both of us do a lot of uh, events like this, uh, where we're, where we're talking with, with someone about, about these issues or, or, or other, other issues. Um, but this one is different because uh, while I, I would say we both participated in 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 these issues, uh, the most striking thing is that we've known each other for I think going on forty years now, <laughs> and and have have had a a wonderful personal relationship that spanned the years, uh, really every year, uh, you know the. But to start to start the discussion, I want to I want to talk a little bit about the the uh, article that was published in the Atlantic last week, uh, the Four Americas, that that uh, you know that that takes part of this book. Um, but I I think that that what's the comment I wanted to make is that it's hugely important to read the entire book. That the article is excellent, but it is not the entire book by a long shot. Um, so, so the, the first questions I'd like to ask you, George, are maybe you could do a brief introduction to what the four Americas are, as that's what, that's kind of what everyone is talking about now. Um, then maybe we could get that established and then we can refer back to it in the rest of the discussion. Um, and then also what are, what are the, what are the key aspects of what you wanted to do that are missing from the article and that, that are present in the book? Well, I'm glad you asked it that way, Tom, because um, some people read the excerpt in the Atlantic and thought that was the book and perhaps got a a mistaken impression of the book. The excerpt is about four, what I call four narratives of what America's identity is. And those are the four narratives that have dominated 
my adult life, your adult life, Tom, all the 40 years that we've known each other. And in fact, they sort of take place over a period of four decades in which each narrative has its turn as the, the dominant of the dominant narratives. Um, what they are not is an attempt to portray the entire country. I haven't tried to set out to describe America and Americans. My book, The Unwinding, came closer to that with a lot of reporting and a lot of research. This book is an essay. It's actually kind of a political pamphlet in the tradition of that genre. Um, so rather than try to portray all of us, which is impossible, I'm describing not an ethnography, but narratives. And the four I call in pithy shorthand, um, free America, smart America, real America, and just America. What are they? Free America is the America of Ronald Reagan, the America of low taxes, deregulation, um, getting government out of the way so that Americans can pursue their dreams with in all the individual talent and enterprise they can muster. Um, it has been the orthodoxy of the Republican Party ever since Reagan in the 80s. It's been the most potent of the four in shaping the terms of political rhetoric and ideas in our, in our adult lives. It has a libertarian uh, philosophical basis to it. Um, but it has also failed to bring widespread prosperity. The promises of small government and unleashing business as the key to freedom and prosperity turned out to be a hollow promise for a lot of Americans. We can get back to that. Each of these has a value and each of them has a, a blind spot or a serious failing. Smart America is somewhat connected to, re, to free America. It is the America of the educated, the professionals, um, the meritocrats as, as they're called, the class of people who by virtue of their talent, their education and their effort have risen to the top of our um, economy, not as capitalists, not as people with investments and with uh, speculation, but as people with brains who've used their brains and the professions that, that, that use their brains in order to shape our economy and to secure good lives for themselves and their children. Um, I think of it as the America of Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton, the America of the 90s. So if free America began in the 80s, smart America had its heyday in the 90s when education became the answer that the Democratic Party gave to almost every social problem, retraining, education, making college available to all, that was the answer. Um, it, it went along with a faith in globalization in, to, and this is where it, it overlaps with free America in deregulation, um, in the free flow of goods and capital and human beings and ideas across the globe. It's a cosmopolitan narrative. It too has a, has a failing, a serious failing. And I would describe it as meritocracy has become a kind of aristocracy where families and children are actually born meritocrats. They, are, they don't make themselves meritocrats. If, if you are born into the right family, in the right school district, with the right connections, with the right work ethic that your parents gave you, um, and go to the right schools and enter the right profession, your ticket is punched. And in a sense, it's all laid out before you and it takes an effort to fail rather than to succeed. So I think the real hollowness of smart America is the promise of meritocracy, which is a good system. It's a system that rewards effort and talent, has turned into a kind of, of, of closed world in which only certain Americans can gain admission. The third narrative is real America. It's a rebellion against free America and smart America. Real America is a phrase Sarah Palin used during the 2008 campaign. She was talking about the small towns, the rural areas 
in what are what we should call the white Christian heartland of the country as the place where America really existed. And everything else, the, the coastal elites, uh, the liberal college campuses, and the non-white cities are not real America. It was a very divisive um, way of dividing us, of, of, of seeing us. But it has a lot of power. And I think there's a straight line from Sarah Palin to Donald Trump. Donald Trump's presidency was based on a new narrative which really turned its back rhetorically on free America. He was not talking about free trade. He was not talking about welcoming immigrants. He wasn't talking about deregulation. He was deregulating. He was cutting taxes. But the narrative that he ran on and won on was a kind of rebellion against uh, the dogmas of free and smart America and instead fed the, res the resentments and the grievances of Americans who felt they're the backbone of the country and they've been left behind, they've been ignored, they've been despised. The fourth narrative is also a rebellion. I call it just America. I think of it as the America of people under 35 generally. Um, it is uh, a millennial narrative and it's a rebellion above all against their parents who live in smart America because the meritocracy, which promised personal success and also gradual social change for the better and America as a more perfect union, what we often heard from Barack Obama, for this generation and this narrative, that turned out to be a lie. And in fact, equality uh, and democracy uh, as, as practiced here are lies because they actually cover up the truth, which is certain groups up in, uh, oppressing other groups. Since time immemorial, there's a kind of Faulknerian, the past isn't dead, it isn't even past. We're still yeah. living with the effects of slavery and segregation. So it's, and race is at the heart of this narrative. So, and it, and it was in the streets of, of America last summer with the George Floyd protest. So just America is a rebellion against the complacent narrative of smart America, just as real America is a rebellion against the ossified uh, dogma of free America. Those are the four. You can sort of see they go chronologically up to the present. Yeah. And I think that that leaves us where we are today. And that is what the rest of the book is about. You know, as, as, um, as an analysis of, of American culture, I, I, I think, you, you know, you make it clear that, that your four narratives are not comprehensive, but they're incredibly incisive. Um, and and the the I think that just about everybody I've talked to who has read it, uh, you know, re really sees how striking they are and how 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 deep that that analysis gets into into the current conditions that we're in. Um, you know, so so uh, that was a really great description of them. What what. Uh, you know, as you as I'll I'll come back to this in a second also, but this is as you said, this is a this this book is kind of a pamphlet. It's not a, it's a direct essay. It's not exactly a, a a manifesto. But you're not so much telling a story as in many of your other books, but you're making an argument. So yeah. you know, yeah. keeping that in mind, what what in the book? What 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 would you say? Uh, where are you going in the book that you, that the article doesn't get to? Yeah, it is an argument, but it's also a sort of argument with myself. I think the best uh, political writing always is in some sort of quarrel uh, with its own ideas and assumptions, because I think any American who's honest today has to admit that half the time we don't know what the hell is going on. Um, we don't know what's about to happen or why the thing that just happened happened nor do we know what direction to go in. Should we try for compromise? Should we be absolutely uncompromising? Should we reach out our hand across the great divide of uh, red and blue? Or should we give them the back of our hand because they've given us the back of their hand? For me, these are not easy questions. I'm, I'm never in one mode. Um, and this book, I set out to write it partly because of that internal division which for me is a fruitful state. It's not a state to, mm -hmm. to try to avoid. It's, it's where thinking comes from. 
So I wrote it without knowing where it was going to take me. It was a bit of a high wire act. I didn't have a conclusion when I set out. A lot of books are written almost like an 800 word op-ed where the writer knows exactly what the point is and states it at the outset and then takes you to the right there to at the end. And I didn't write this that way. It's more of a, of a meditation, although it's an urgent one. It has a lot of uh, a sense of, of intensity because I wrote it in w one of the most turbulent periods of American history between the pandemic, the election, and January 6th and the insurrection of that day and the inauguration of Joe Biden. It was a three month roller coaster. And I was trying to capture something deep and old about us at the same time as I was trying to hold on to this wild horse that was uh, throwing all of us around, which was America today. Where did I end up? I ended up with two key words. One is equality and one is self-government. Now, what do they mean and why are those the key words of the book? I was reading a lot of Tocqueville while I was uh, getting ready to write this book. And I still think democracy in America is the best single guide to this country. There was just so much that Tocqueville saw as a foreigner that is still accurate, still relevant. And the first thing Tocqueville says is the most important fact about Americans is their passion for equality, which means not the fact of equality or the ideal of equality, which is enshrined, of course, in the very beginning of the Declaration of Independence, the passion for equality, a desire, and he calls it ardent and eternal and unquenchable. It's something that cannot be snuffed out. Americans believe they should be as good as everyone else. They believe no world, no opportunity, <clears throat> no place should be forbidden to them because of who they are or where they're born. And of course, throughout our history, we've failed spectacularly to make that a reality, but it nonetheless is this almost um, a kind of dynamo that drives our society because it's inside Americans as a eternal passion. Well, once you take that as your starting point, equality, then you look at America today and the America of these four narratives. And the thing that strikes you is inequality, that each of them um, is both a response to inequality and in some ways furthers inequality <clears throat> because we have divisions by race, by class, by education, by region that in some ways are as deep as they've been in a hundred years. Um, and that has happened in our adult lives. That's been a dramatic trajectory that failed to take the post-war democracy that was beginning to spread prosperity more widely and turn it into a multi-everything democracy in the 21st century, a democracy for people from everywhere and of every race and every ethnicity. That was the challenge we faced starting around 1970. And I would say <clears throat> we succeeded in some ways, we became a more tolerant country, a more inclusive country, a more diverse country for sure. But did we become a more equal country? I don't think so. I think we've become more unequal. And that inequality is the, I think, the poison, it's the source of so much of the bitterness and polarization and resentment that divides not just red and blue America, but the four narratives that I just laid out. Tocqueville also uses the phrase self-government and he calls it an art. And this is important. It's not simply a fact of the way we live. It's not something we inherit. It's not something we're born knowing how to do. If, if equality is an instinct, Self-government is a skill that has to be learned and learned again, and that can easily be forgotten. And I think one thing that's happened during this period is we have lost the art of self-government. We don't know how to govern ourselves, how to work together to solve problems, how to debate each other, argue with each other, compromise with each other, all the skills that go in to governing our own affairs. Um, 
So equality and self-government are connected in my mind. This is sort of where the book lands in the sense that without restoring conditions of equality or creating them, we will never govern ourselves well because we don't have that feeling of shared citizenship that Americans uh, need in order to govern themselves. But we also will never restore or create conditions of equality until we reacquire or relearn how to govern ourselves, which is a lot of skills that actually can be learned. There are ways to do it. Um, so those are the two essences that we Americans live by and, and die by. And um, that's where I go in the book toward what I call equal America. That's my narrative. That's the narrative I've tried to put in place of the four that I think have failed us. Yeah, your, your description of, of uh, you know, self-government um, is so striking to me, having, having worked in, in government in, you know, in this small city of Culver City for, for a number of years now. It really is an art. And, 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 and it's an art that is not, you know, the, uh, most people don't even know that and don't even try is what's, is what's harsh about it. And when it, when the, when government works well, it's because someone does that well. Um, well, let me ask you, because you are the expert on this among the two of us, what are the skills that are, are needed for self-government? What do we have to learn in order to govern ourselves? The first thing is to listen. That's that's probably the, the first and most important thing is to listen, listen actively, listen deeply and listen broadly to to all the parts of your community and, and, and be open to them. It's like even even, you know, the, the, the craziest things you hear, you've got to be able to find the 10 percent in, in there that that you can identify with and the, and that that puts us on the same, you know, in the same room as Americans. You know, yeah. the, the um, you know, you're you're you write quite a bit about in this book about patriotism in the, in the most interesting way. And, you know, and it made me think of patriotism on the local level, because, here, you know, Culver City, you know, I, I've talked already, you know, just in the past couple of weeks to to the uh, to folks here in Culver City and particularly those who are governing now about the four Culver Cities, because we absolutely uh. have have the four Culver cities just as there are the four Americas and they are at each other's throats. Um, mm. You know, for, for, for our audience, uh, you know, particularly abroad, I should describe a little bit. Culver city is really kind of a, a wonderful example because it's a city with where, where our populace, our residents have pretty deep roots. You know, there are folks that go back here, that families that, that here that go back, you know, many, many decades and many families that go back at least into the fifties. Um, and they, a lot of them just don't want anything to change, but change is happening inevitably. And, and in, and Culver city is a small city. So, so we get to see our, our government working very well, you know, only about 40,000, but we're right in the heart of, of the, you know, 10 million resident metropolis of Los Angeles. Uh, you know, Culver City is physically located, you know, in the heart of the west side of Los Angeles. And then the other extraordinary thing here is that we have the headquarters of Apple and Amazon Studios, um, mm -hmm. as well as Sony Pictures. And then HBO is about to locate here. And we have a whole bunch of other high tech companies here. So we are heading in the direction that, you know, San Francisco and Silicon Valley and and uh, Seattle have gone. So we're, we're expecting you know, 10,000 new jobs here over the next three to five years with those companies. So the pressures are tremendous. Uh, the pressures of gentrification, the pressures of, of, kind, of a certain kind of over, overpopulation that creates traffic congestion, housing crisis is, is, you know, we're ground zero for all that stuff here. So, and so I wonder um, if I think local is crucial here because our national politics are so blocked and immediately go to the most extreme disagreements, which becomes vitriolic to the point of we can't live together anymore. <clears throat> but they're all abstract in a way. It's rarely about what's actually happening on yeah. your street, yeah. your family. And I wonder if maybe learning the art of self-government locally is the place to start, because at least 
there's a problem that everyone can identify and a solution that everyone could see if they could get to it. I think we are making progress there, you know, not that, you know, and, and as I was thinking about this discussion earlier, I was thinking, well, you know, the, the stuff that we fight over here in Culver City is very specific. Um, you know, we have we have a, a meeting coming up next week that's got people lined up around the block ready to fight each other. Um, and and but to explain exactly what that is, I realized would be kind of would be rather complex, but it still kind of lines up. Uh, along the four cover cities and then uh, and along right and left too, the way people are fighting. Yeah. So if, yeah. if I, th I think you're right that, that if, you know, to try to come to an understanding if those folks, and this is certainly what I've tried to do in my tenure in public office is to try to try to find the common ground amongst those people. But I'll tell you, it's incredibly hard. It's incredibly yeah. hard. And at, at a certain point, you have to make a decision and you have to move forward and you're not going to bring everybody with you. That's, 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 you know, just, I, that's just the reality. I've begun, to, I've begun to get rather cynical about um, our media and especially our media elites because I think, and there's a bit in the book, more than a bit, quite a bit about journalism today <clears throat> and the yeah. need for journalists to get back to the heart of their trade, which is reporting and listening, as you say, Tom, journalism is a form of self-government. It's a crucial tool for self-governing people, but it can't happen without listening and without going out and actually observing how people are living. Whereas all the incentives, both financial and in some ways, career incentives are for journalists to establish a brand on social media and then to build up their own crowd, their tribe, at the expense of some other tribe, and always to make their tribe happy so that people censor themselves all the time because they're afraid of losing followers or losing friends. To me, this is a just a travesty of journalism, but it really is the way um, at the elite level, a lot of it is happening. And it, I think part of what we need to do in order to reacquire the art of self-government is for journalism to become, uh, it, it will never go back to what it was and nor should it. Maybe the era of Walter Cronkite and Time Magazine was, uh, was deeply flawed because it left out so many voices uh, who are now heard. But to be able to have voices heard and yet to listen, not just to hear, but to listen that's what journalism needs, and I think it's part of this project of, of acquiring the art of self-government. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, um, arriving at, at self-government and equality, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I can't help but think about, you know, how did you, how did you get there? You know, what, what has been your own political mm -hmm. evolution from, you know, democratic socialists in Boston, that's probably 30 years ago now that you wrote about that. And, and, yeah. and, you know, how, how does, you know, how does this, uh, how does, how does this book relate to the George Packer who wrote B Blood of the Liberals and, you know, and, and the, and, and your other previous writing, you know, as, as, as well as, as, the threads that go through your other previous writing, clearly unwinding is in the back of this and the series of recent articles uh, that you've done for the Atlantic during the crisis that made such an impact nationally. Well, so I'll just tell the audience, I come from a, um, an academic family. I grew up uh, at Stanford University, not far from Tom Small, who was going yes. to a nearby high school. Uh, and even running track while I was running track, but we didn't meet each other until we got to college. And that was one of the great things about going to college was getting to be your friend. Um, my <clears throat> experience as a kid was of the 60s on a college campus, which was a tumultuous place. Even quiet, rich Stanford University had riots and arson and protests and a lot of tension. And my parents were right in the thick of it. Yeah. In fact, in a way, my father, who was in the Stanford administration, his life kind of ended as a result of the, the student revolution and the upheavals of the 60s. So for me, politics was at the dinner table. My mother comes from a political family. Her father was a congressman from Birmingham, Alabama. 
between the Woodrow Wilson and the Franklin Roosevelt presidency. So we were Democrats. We were of different strains. My father was Jewish, a different kind of Democrat, but we, uh, politics was, uh, in my, in my lunchbox and at the dinner table. So what, what does one do with that? I mean, to me, my career as a journalist, which began sort of a little late in life around the age of 40 was all about having my preconceptions challenged and upended because when you go out into the world, whether it's, to a mill town in North Carolina or to uh, Baghdad, Iraq, whatever preconceptions you have really should be overturned because reality is far too complicated and unpredictable for it to ever, ever absolutely affirm what we want it to say. And I grew to believe that it's actually a lucky thing when you find it doesn't do that, when it does challenge you. So a series of books, Blood of the Liberals, which is about my family's history on my mother and, and father's side. Um, the Assassin's Gate, which is about how America got into Iraq. The Unwinding, which is about parts of the country that were being left behind by globalization and then by the financial crisis. And certain characters, certain Americans you've never heard of, who were struggling to make sense of the, all these upheavals in their lives and to, in some ways, <clears throat> be good citizens in their communities. Um, all of this led me to a pretty dark view of the country. I think the last 20 years have been a series of shocks from 9-11 to the Iraq war, to the financial crisis, the Great Recession, uh, the election of Donald Trump, the pandemic, and the insurrection of January 6th. These are things that Americans of our generation, Tom, did not think happened. At least most of us did not imagine yeah. the country going through these shocks. And so they kind of left me far less confident that our democratic system could survive, that Americans could live together, that good ideas would prevail, Good, that reason and argument and debate would always lead to better outcomes. Instead, uh, I, I'm in a place now where I think it's 50-50, whether we're going to have a healthy democracy in five years or 10 years, whether our children are going to inherit a country that the world still thinks of as a place of opportunity and um, sort of the land of the future. So it's been certainly a trajectory of decline in this country, <clears throat> but I wrote Last Best Hope very much to, um, to try to talk myself into a better place because really for our children, for my children, I don't want to settle into some kind of comfortable pessimism of late middle age where everything is in decline and it's almost satisfying to look back, to sit back and watch it happen because yeah. you can say, I told you so. No, I wanted to find a way to describe America that is totally clear and honest and unvarnished, but that in the end looks for some unifying things, some national characteristics, a national identity. That's where patriotism comes in, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that there be, without a love of your country, just as without a love of your family, you can't get anything done. No large projects, whether it's slowing down global warming, saving democracy, ending racism, can be achieved without the national solidarity that comes with patriotic feelings. So, yeah, George, not, George, let me just yeah. George, let me just interrupt you there for a second because it's it's when you when you take when you see that on the local level, it becomes so clear. Because the yeah. the you know patriotism you know is is a concept that certainly has been questioned, um, you know, and yeah. and you know, and certainly many in in just America and in smart America don't necessarily relate to it, uh, you know, in a way that 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 might be entirely positive. But but when you're on the level of a city, you know, even even the most extreme voices here in Culver City, they're there because they love this city and because they right. they love it and they see what's being done here 
on a governmental level affecting directly the quality of their lives and and right. their their hope for their children their hope that their children might actually get to live here someday so that that was just what i wanted to interject so i i think you're right uh yeah. you you feel it more on the local level as you feel it more in your own family yeah the the, the attachment yeah. is visceral it's instinctive i think most people feel an instinctive attachment to their country. It takes some doing, some anger or alienation, or just some level of civilization where it no longer really holds you anymore. But I think it's a loss. And that you pointed to smart and just America as being places where it's either simply disappeared or is actively suspected for being a kind of a lie. And I think it's impossible to talk people out of that, but they should be aware of what they've lost because I do think, as you say, that that, that attachment, that, that loyalty, it can be the source of wanting to make it better. Why should we bother if the country is hopeless or if half the country are evil? Um, it, why is it worth trying? So it, even to try requires a certain sense that it's worth it. Um, and so in the book, I've tried to describe Americans in a way that doesn't just separate us into, into four narratives, but that shows how we've, um, we've also got some common traits that we don't see always, but that foreigners see instantly. So that mm -hmm. Americans who think of each other as, as, being, as having nothing in common, as soon as a, a foreigner encounters them, you're an American. Yeah. You talk like one, you, you make friends like one, you laugh like one, you're, you you enter into any situation as if it's not a problem to be admitted. You know, that's, that's that passion for equality, which makes us both open and direct, but also arrogant and naive. We are clueless about societies in which there's subtle social arrangements and ranks that, you need to be aware of in order to know whether to ask for seconds at dinner. Um, we use first names. Uh, our waiters say, hello, my name is Justin and I'll be taking care of you tonight. I mean, where does a waiter yeah. anywhere else in the world say that? So yeah. this is, I, these seem trivial, but I think they're important traits that hold us together when all the other ligaments seem to be, um, to be breaking. Yeah. You know, um, I guess I was going to say for myself, I, I, I've, I've uh, you know, I'm relating all of these things to my own experience. And, and you, you've made me realize how America, how American I really am, you know, because it's, it's, it's been, you know, being, being, uh, you know, my mother is from the Philippines, as you know, and, and grow, growing up here, being the child of immigrants. You know, I think I think I, I've and, and then in college, I, I certainly, you know, as smart America was being formed, I wanted to have I was attracted to a more internationalist kind of standpoint that, you know, wanting to live abroad and wanting to be part of that international community. Um, but you're you're right. You can't you can't you can take uh, Tom out of America, but you can't take the American out of him. I mean, when you ran for city council. And when you became mayor, I thought that he's come a long way from the Tom I first met in around 1980, who had just come back from Italy and for whom Italy in some ways seemed more like home than America. Yeah. And, now, and now you've settled in one place and have not only settled in it, but you've committed yeah. yourself to all kinds of, of political and civic institutions yeah. in that place because I think having children is a crucial part of committing yourself to a place. I see some questions are coming in. Should we throw it open to the audience and start answering questions? Or I'm not sure we are time wise, but I think I think we can definitely go go uh, take a look at the questions. The the let's start there. We can come back to to my my questions, my further questions that I have later. Mm -hmm. But uh, so one, the first question from the audience is: America was in a unique global position at the end of World War II. Does America have the tools to improve the lot of the real and just America without competing with a devastated world? That's a great question because it shows that our 
um, you could say our heyday as a world power depended to some degree on war, certainly World War II, which catapulted us to world leadership, the Cold War, which gave Americans of our parents' generation a defining cause, a, just a way to see the world, whether or not they liked the policies of the government, the American government in power, the Cold War was a given. And I don't know about you, Tom, but I never imagined it would end. I mean, I just, we were born into it. We grew up in it. Yep. We went to college and I just assumed it would, the Cold War was the way the world was divided and always would be. And then suddenly it ends. And what happened when it ended? There was an article in the Atlantic around 1990 that said why we will miss the Cold War. And I think there was something to that because it gave Americans a sense of mission and also a sense of needing each other. And we can't see each other as, you know, co completely as enemies or else the real enemy, as it was seen, is going to take advantage. Well, without the Cold War, we began to see each other as enemies. And that's when Newt Gingrich, who I think of as the essential politician of the last 40 years, introduced a level of destruction into American politics that we've never we've never looked back. It's gotten worse and worse and worse. And I think that had a direct relation to the end of the Cold War. So the question is, can you have a national project of renewal? Can you answer the, the deep disillusionment of real and just America, which is partly a generational disillusionment, without a foreign enemy, without a unifying cause like World War II, fascism, communism? Um, it's what William James called the moral equivalent of war, yeah. um, meaning a cause or a sense of, of higher purpose that war usually is necessary to produce, that war gives, that war creates unity, it creates sacrifice, it creates, um, at least in it, when the war is conceived as a national project, it's a just one. Um, I don't know if we, if we can. But I do think the end of the Cold War saw the beginning of a lot of decline in our cohesion as Americans. And I think perhaps global warming and climate yeah. change are, is the only thing on the scale of the Cold War that can force us to realize we're in it together. And if we go on fighting, we're all going to die. Unfortunately, there's a lot of Americans who don't even believe there is such a thing. Well, um, yeah, that's just, go, that's just what yeah. I was going to go. That's just what I was going to go to is. Go ahead, Tom. Uh, I was yeah. just going to say, you know, the, the, uh, you know, I certainly had global warming in the back of my mind as you were talking about the Cold War there. But, uh, you know, as, as also, as you point out in the book, when we're, you know, we're, we're in this post truth, you know, post fact, factual environment now. And when you can't agree on, you know, when we have different set of facts, it's, 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 it makes it very hard to, to agree with that. You know, the, you know, here in California and, and throughout the country, and particularly here in Culver City, you know, the housing crisis seems like another thing that we could agree on, but it's, it's, but it, it's, it's, it's very challenging when, when, when. Well, one question, you know, that I've been tossing around lately is how deeply do ordinary people disagree and how much would that disagreement at least cool off a bit? Yeah. If our elites stopped stoking it, if if it stopped being a kind of a career advantage in politics and the media to to feed the disagreement, the the dis, the divisions, and how much would the temperature go down if there was more equality? If some of the policies that I yeah. think Joe Biden is rightly putting in place had a chance to bring Americans up to a level of living where they can actually see each other as fellow citizens. And yeah. that, that for me is probably a better route than simply pounding someone on the head with your point of view, because most people then dig in and, and um, fall back harder and harder on their own. There's a very good question. Yeah, after yeah. That. It follows yeah, right wanna, up on this. Yeah, yeah. Th this question follows right on that subject. Uh, the, this audience question, why was FDR able to develop programs that helped those who needed help? Where were the naysaying Republicans or their equivalent? You know, what, what can we learn from, from what he did? Yeah. 
Well, first of all, there were definitely naysaying Republicans. Uh, Roosevelt called them economic royalists, and he said, they hate me and I welcome their hatred. He did not mind having enemies as long as it was a, a narrowly defined group, namely the, the top of the business class who really did hate him and who were trying like hell to reverse the New Deal. I have a chapter in the book that looks at three periods of crisis of what I call near-death experiences in our past, the Civil War, the Great Depression, and the 60s. And the Great Depression, each of them I write about through the eyes of one person. And in the case of the Great Depression, it's Frances Perkins, who was the first woman cabinet member in American history and who was Roosevelt's labor secretary. And what strikes me about her and about Roosevelt, to answer the question of the audience member, they were reformers, they were progressives, but they were patriotic ones. And they actually used the New Deal to create a national narrative that included more Americans than had been included before. It still left out some Americans, especially black and brown Americans, but it did include more poor people, more working people, small town farmers, people who had not been um, seen as sort of having equal status in the America of the Gilded Age. And it became a, a narrative that was extremely powerful because it tapped into that sense of patriotism and of loving the country so that when Roosevelt had to go from the New Deal to the Second World War, it was sort of a natural turn. He had already created enough of a not a consensus, because there's never a consensus, but enough of a sense that this is what we have to do as Americans, that when it then became fighting fascism, that generation was ready to be told, now the next thing we need to do as Americans is to fight right. fascism. Right. So that's one way FDR right. was able to pass legislation. He also didn't have Fox News and Mitch McConnell to deal with every day. And that's a different story and something we can't forget. Yeah. Yeah. The the other there's another great question here. Uh, do you agree that in addition to learning to listen, our education uh, needs to include civics again and teach critical thinking skills? Uh, also, how to evaluate media sources and what else? This this kind of goes to, you know, one of my big questions that we keep coming back to, which is, you know, what does it mean to do to the average guy self-government? What does it mean? And it seems to me that the, the question's getting at that. Well, I wrote an essay in The Atlantic um, a few weeks ago about civics education. Yeah. Uh, there's, a, there's a new um, project called Educating for American Democracy that <clears throat> proposes, you know, every 20 years, historians, social scientists try to bring civics back. Because yeah. as you know, Tom, it's just not taught the way it was when we were young. When we were young... Yeah. Everyone was given the basics of how a bill becomes a law and what are the three branches of government and what's in the Bill of Rights, the basics. I don't think you can teach it that way anymore. Kids yeah. are not just going to sit back and passively take it in. They're going to want to know what does this have to do with me, with my world, with the protests that I went to yesterday. I And what this project and what I – what I like about it is it doesn't say here's a curriculum that everyone should learn because then you immediately get into the fight of red against blue school board against school board. It ends up in um, a kind of complete disintegration. Instead, what this project uh, educating for American democracy says is we need to teach kids not what to think, but how to think, how to think critically, how yeah. to understand <clears throat> different points of view, different interpretations of the same uh, amendment of the Bill of Rights or of the same event in American history, and to then debate and to learn how to debate. This is something, because our schools now are so siloed politically, some schools are moving toward a kind of extreme form of progressivism. Uh, I've written about that in the case of my own kids. Other schools are moving toward an extreme form of conservatism, whole state legislatures are banning the teaching of certain subjects. Once you go down that road, you, there's just no one uh, can begin to think about how to govern ourselves. It's it's rather how to arm ourselves in order to not be killed, in order to win the war. 
So I think school is the place where it has to happen, but it has to happen, and this requires a certain kind of teacher, it has to happen in a way that doesn't have the answer to every question, but that teaches kids how to think, how to read, how to, how to go back to the sources, get off, maybe even get off the internet, and which is the teacher of every child in the country these days, yeah. and uh, learn what we can from the past to solve the problems of the present and the future. Those those forces are are struggling within our school district here here in Culver City very much. The the uh, the way forward is just not clear because the 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 and, and your your four Americas analysis gets into that as well. But but there are you know there are glimmers of hope. I know I, I you know I noticed in your acknowledgments that uh, you had uh, a book uh, by that where Eric Liu was one of the authors with his. Citizen University that he has up in Seattle that's trying to teach civics on 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 a on a broader basis. Um, the the uh, so there's stuff that's happening. The you know the the University of Arizona. Uh, you know I, you cited uh, an institute there also. Um, Arizona we were the state has a an institute for civics uh, in education. Yeah. yeah, there are a lot of things happening. Daniel Allen of Harvard is involved in both the Eric Liu project, which is more about how to reconnect citizens to their government, yeah. and the, the civics project, Educating for American Democracy. I think it's, it's a broad sense of crisis. We have reached a point where the pen, if the pandemic didn't make it clear that we've lost the art of self-government, nothing ever will. And what do we need besides my team winning and your team losing in order to regain that art? I think far-sighted people are beginning to realize the problem is deep. It's in ourselves, it's in our children, it's in our schools, it's in our institutions. And we have to get beyond the simple desire to win um, in order to have a chance of actually governing ourselves because we're stuck with each other. We are quarantined together. As yeah. Americans, I have a line in the book where I quote a friend saying that her her husband and children were not the people she would have chosen to be quarantined. With. I love that. <laughs> I don't know how many people felt that way. Are are Americans the people I would choose to be quarantined yeah. with? I don't know, but I am. So how do we yeah. proceed? We we keep thinking the next election will eliminate the other side, and we will be able to win and conquer. Never, it never happens. We're happen. all stuck with, and we're stuck with each other. And the, the next question goes to that as well. You know, do we need a better, the next question from the audience is, do we need a better definition of American, quote, exceptionalism since the old one was so flawed? How, how, can, how, how would you think about, Amer about the concept of American exceptionalism at this point? I mean, I was, I was a believer in it for a long time, and this maybe gets back to the the arc that you had me describe in, in the course of my books and my career. And that's deep it's in the Holbrook first, book as well. Absolutely. The biography of Richard Holbrook yeah. was an account of the period and of a man who believed passionately that America had to lead the world, that without us problems would not get solved, and that we had a special calling um, to... Uh, extend freedom and a kind of humanitarian impulse to the rest of the world. With Holbrook, it was the war in Bosnia that was the peak of that. I don't believe in American exceptionalism. I think it, it probably obfuscates more than it clarifies. And I think it may be better for us to say we, we don't, have, if we did have a special mission, we no longer can carry it out. The world has moved on without us. There are too many rival systems, rival powers. Um, we flatter ourselves to think we have this, this divine or secular mission, and we um, get into trouble. The Iraq War is a good example. The Vietnam mm -hmm. War was an example. Mm -hmm. Instead, I'd like us to see ourselves as one country among many, um, mm -hmm with its flaws, we were the world leader in coronavirus. That doesn't seem very worthy of an exceptional America. Instead, let's see America as it is with its flaws, 
But that allows us to be a country instead of a model, instead of a myth, and instead of a torch of freedom. It allows us to be a country that has traits, that has things that hold it together, um, and that and, and that has um, that has to live and die together. Whereas if if we're just a, an idea, then that idea is fragile. Every, every idea is fragile and can be snuffed out. So I, I, I'm moving beyond exceptionalism. I want America to be a country that sets a good example, but that doesn't think it has a mission to change the world. And that has to begin really by getting our own house in order because right now it's, uh, it's pretty dire. That's where that's where I would go with that concept is that that, you know, I, I think if you want to if you want to find an American exceptionalism, uh, it would be in that kind of patriotism that we talked about a little earlier. Uh, right. And, you know, and it, and, it, and it brings me to a couple of things that, I, you know, to something I had noted down, you know, what what American, you know, our vision of America, you, you it, it, at one beautiful moment in the book, you quote this poem let America be America again, that Langston Hughes wrote uh, in, uh, as you write, in 1936 on an all-light train ride. But uh, the, the, it goes, oh yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath, America will be. You know, I couldn't I couldn't help but thinking about the 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 way Filipinos in this country often think of themselves, you know, with with our our sort of uh, uh, the spark of our culture here really is in in Carlos Bulosan's uh, book, America's in the Heart, that has that yeah. same sort of concept that, you know, that yeah. Bulosan lived this horrible, <laughs> often horrible life. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and yet yet he always believed that America was in his heart. And that it was something to reach toward. I mean, I I believe that immigrants will be our salvation. Um, I believe that they bring that just as we are growing weary and divided and cynical and disillusioned with one another, and maybe you're tired of living together and and have lost faith in the idea. <clears throat> Whitman called it the fervid and tremendous idea which is self-government. Um, immigrants keep coming as hard as we make it on them. They keep coming. And they, I think they are the, <laughs> the force, the energy that's going, if anything can keep us from slowly curling up within ourselves because uh, of these 20 years of shocks, it will be each new wave of immigrants and that to me is the, <laughs> the if, if there is an American idea and if it's the, if that idea is key to our um, survival as a country, um, the people who believe in it most are gonna be the ones who just got here. And so we, that's my, uh, Carlos Bulasan is a great example of uh, how the, the harshest view of America can co can coexist with the love of America and the belief that America in in the end is going to redeem itself. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. There's another great question. I'm skipping over one question. That we'll come back to, but another great question in the in the chat is: Do do you feel the United States is headed in a direction of a bit of a cold civil war itself between the four Americas? seems like that's what kind of what we're in but is it is it yeah. possible to create scenarios where all four americas are winners right i think cold civil war is the right term for it i think i used that yeah. phrase in last best hope um yeah i do i do think we have that between the red and the blue but it's complicated by the fact that on each side of the cold civil war there is this internal war between generations and between narratives, between free and real, between smart and just. Um, and all of all four have winners and losers. That is where they fall apart. Free America, the winners are the entrepreneurs, the, the makers. The losers are people on government benefits, the takers. Smart America, the winners are the meritocrats, the people with educational credentials. The losers are 
the people who've dropped out of high school and don't see the future as having a bright um, light for them. Real America, the winners are the, the people who work with their hands, the people who live in the small towns, the losers are the elites and the non-whites who are not really American. And in just America, it's all inverted. And the winners are the, you know, the first one now shall later be last, as Dylan said. It's a bottom rail on top. The winners are the oppressed classes and the losers are the classes that have historically oppressed them and which now have to sort of step aside and let the oppressed class uh, take power. Winners and losers are the problem with these narratives and and the, the competition that comes from that, the sense of desperate struggle to survive and not be eliminated. For me, the, to answer the, the question, my, my little phrase of equal America is the best I can do because it has a capacious, uh, it, it throws its arms out wide. It embraces as many of us as possible. It says we can only function when there is a sense of equality. Now, what does it mean? It doesn't mean we all live the same. It doesn't mean we all have the same amount. It's not equality of results. It's equality under the law. It's equality of opportunity, genuine equality of opportunity, which is actually a radical idea because it would mean changing the entire funding structure of public education away from local taxes, which yeah. create massive inequality. Um, and it's equal status, a sense of being just as good as everyone else as citizens. Um, and it's so it's a kind of subtle and more spiritual quality as well. It's not simply a concrete state. I think anything that gets us closer to equal America is um, a, a step away from cold civil war. Yeah. And on, on, on the local level, I would say that is absolutely what the art of government is, is it's, is it's trying to find solutions that trying to find scenarios where everyone can be a winner, you know, in a way that 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 brings the whole city forward. Um, and it's it's very it's it's very hard to do. But, you know, we have we have very bright people now, you know, on our city council here in, in Culver City. And I think that that, you know, we have we have quite an extraordinary mayor um, who is who is trying to do that. And and it's it's uh, it's it's very hard. And he gets attacked from all sides, from all all four Culver cities come after him. Um, and yet, yet that's what he has to keep on pressing, keep on trying to do. Right. That's that's certainly what I tried to do when I was in office. Um, and uh, you know the the hope for the you know to cool down or not cool down, but to calm down that civil war. Um, I, I think you're you're right that the economics are at the basis the base of it, and and on the local level too. It's like we 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 have to have more equality or or we're not going to get anywhere i think we're almost at the end of our time tom but there's one more question maybe we should throw that one out there and then wrap it up your your most specific here's the question your most specific prescription is one or two years of compulsory national service which is a great idea what does it say about this policy that no public figure promotes it for his or her own generation <clears throat> Well, it says we're all hypocrites, uh, I suppose. <laughs> that's one That's one interpretation. I'm not sure it's true. There have been a lot of veterans who have come into politics, Iraq and Afghanistan veterans, who really do believe in service. And I don't know if they've advocated compulsory national service per se, but it, it's become a um, a mantra for certain Americans who, who have served. Um, mm -hmm. But it's true that most people who are 18 or 19 or 20 don't want to be told you owe your country something and you also would benefit from being forced out of your bubble and put together with Americans from completely different backgrounds in some common project, whether it's 
uh, military service or the Peace Corps or building bridges and roads or working in the national parks or teaching, why shouldn't that be a one-year commitment that we ask of Absolutely. all Americans? And I think it would go such a long way toward um, getting us past the demonization that is the default response to any idea we dis we dislike. If there's a human being behind that idea, if that human being can explain the context for the idea, can tell you their life story so that the idea begins to make sense, at least to them in their lights, in their eyes, that to me is the kind of invaluable personal experience that then makes us more capable of self-government. It's yeah. one among many suggestions, but I guess if I were God and could wave a wand, that would be the first one I would impose on this country, and I think it would do a lot of good. Well, uh, our colleagues out there listening to this, take that up. So yeah. I think that I think that is a, a, a wonderful note to conclude on. I think we're a little over time, but we got started a little late. Um, so, George, I hope we can I hope we can I, I make a little series out of this. You know, um, you know, when you're out at the at the Thomas Mann house, let's do this again on on different subjects. Um, I'd love to. I'd love to. Yeah. And thank you, Tom, for for doing it, for being part of it and for being part of your community, which you have committed yourself to in all kinds of ways that I really admire. Well, what a what a pleasure. I'm not I, I'm not sure uh, exactly how we how we end. If if uh, folks from the Thomas Mann House would like to step in and uh, <laughs> announce us, this thing, over. <laughs> yeah, help us say say goodbye. Um. We Are have had, we here? have, as, as always, we have had some, some, uh, technical challenges as they're always on this thing, but actually, actually this went really smooth. Maybe we've you, just you, been talking to each other. <laughs> <laughs> which would, which would, which I miss more than just about anything actually. Yeah. If, if that's what this was about, then it was time yeah. well spent. All right. Well, I'm going to press leave studio and, um, say goodbye to everybody and thank you. Terrific. Thank, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, George.